Good, so maybe I'll take a little of that extra time uh, as we go through. So my name is Seth Ettenberg, as you heard, and I'm the honor of representing Blue Rock Therapeutics to introduce you to our company if you haven't heard from us before or to update you on our significant progress the last time I stood on this podium about a year ago. Um, so Blue Rock is a wholly owned subsidiary of Bayer Pharmaceuticals, I think, and we believe that that creates a unique microenvironment for us to work in in the biotech industry that gives us the best of both worlds. To give you a brief snapshot about the company, we're about 380 uh, passionate, focused scientists uh, bringing forward across four different locations. The newest of those locations we just announced is to help with our footprint to go into global clinical trials uh, uh, in the coming months. Um, in, Ber in Germany and Berlin. We cover four disease areas as listed here. Uh, the most recent of those disease areas uh, you might have seen a, a, from us is in a cl close collaboration with Dave Gamm and his group at Opsis Therapeutics, a Fujifilm wholly owned subsidiary, in a tight partnership. Uh, and then, of course, it's not enough to build an, a unique and uh, 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 extensive iPS cell or induced pluripotent stem cell-based allogeneic platform, but you need then all the core capabilities that allow you to bring that to patients. Um, those, are, those include the ability to not only to use wild-type authentic cells, but the ability to edit the genomes and enhance those uh, cells therapeutic potential, as well as an integrated end-to-end -end CMC. You heard a lot about that this morning. This is core to the ability of our field to, to, to advance into the marketplace. And then finally, execution and clinical development along with device development as we will deliver these cells to unique locations throughout the body. So at Blue Rock, we have sort of two technologies that we speak of. The first of those is authentic cellular replacement. You heard nicely that in degenerative diseases, it's clear that we understand that patients already come forward with in, in instances such as Parkinson's disease with up to as much as 80% of cells lost to cell death at initial diagnosis. And so the vision for Blue Rock is quite simple and bold in both statements, which is to replace those cells that are lost to disease or to aging in a, dege in a degenerative disease setting, and then to bring back and restore the fun full functionality uh, of those cells and reverse the disease. Um, easier said than done, I'm sure. Um, the other is, is in what we call our engineered authentic cells, which I introduced you to in the last uh, slide. In order to build this, we've spent many years perfecting what we would call our source uh, raw materials, and that is materials from healthy donors. We've spent a lot of time creating quality source material, both uh, in aspects of what we know will be important to regulatory bodies and then to commercial endeavors going forward. Um, with that, we partnered with Be The Match in order to, and we continue to partner with Be Match in order to continue to, to, to uh, increase our donor um, uh, existence. Um, we then have a proprietary reprogramming platform that allows us to take those differentiated adult cells back to their pluripotent state and thus creating the chassis or the framework by which to build the rest, the, to build our pipeline and our medicines on. You'll hear me say over and over again that um, the field has a lot of opportunity ahead of it and it would be uh, remiss if we didn't talk about all of the collaborations, and I hope a theme that you'll hear throughout this morning is our ability and our desire to continue to collaborate with those that have specialized in areas such as in CRISPR gene editing, where we partnered early on with Editas Medicine, one of the four leaders in this type of uh, genetic engineering, as well as in recent years with Senti Biosciences, who I know is here uh, at the conference this, this week um, to create gene circuits that allows our, ce our cells to have advanced technology as these cells go into therapeutic application. Our founders, our academic founders, for which we stand on their shoulders, have spent the past 20 years, and we continue to look for and seek new academic relationships um, that hold both unique cell types as well as unique models uh, to help us develop our pipeline. As I've mentioned that pipeline uh, uh, several times, uh, we have a broad pipeline across that, those four uh, disease indications. Uh, on the bottom of this pipeline, you'll see, as I just came off the collaboration slide, that we have three uh, opportunities to bring sight back to patients by building uh, 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 both rods and cones as well as RPE cells with some of the leading leaders in this field uh, at Opsis Therapeutics. And this is a really unique relationship that allows us to put not only the, our four companies together to bring this forward to the marketplace. 
Um, I'm going to spend a little more time on the top of our uh, on the top of this pipeline. Uh, give you an update on our lead project, which is in Parkinson's disease, known as DAO1, as well as spend a moment to tell you about Blue Rock's first platform cell type, that, and we refer to it as a platform cell type because it allows us to go after many indications with the very same cell. So DAO1, as I mentioned, is our lead, at, our lead uh, drug discovery and clinical asset. Um, we've announced in June of this year that we completed enrollment of our phase one clinical trial, dosing 12 patients through two different dose escalations across multiple clinical sites, uh, both surgical sites and enrollment sites. Um, we have now, since the closing of that enrollment, just as quickly opened up a non-interventional study. As I mentioned earlier, this is our foray into Europe and Berlin, where, we'll, where we are recruiting globally a non-interventional study that, as mentioned earlier, allows us to both study the pathology of the disease in the current day setting, as well as get patients ready to enter into our late stage development. And with that, we're leveraging both the NIS study as well as the learnings and, and the data from our phase one clinical study. Now, moving into, the clinical, into clinical practice for cell therapy, and especially into cell therapy that where we place the cells, as you heard earlier nicely from Aspen, into the midbrain of it with a midbrain genopinergic neuron, um, requires both development and expertise around device and adaptation of those devices for clinical and for market as well as both formulation and distribution. We are an off-the-shelf allogeneic cell that is ready for use, and that requires both learnings at the, at the site with the, our neurosurgeons as well as our patient population. And then finally, you've heard me say several times, this is not simple small molecule or protein therapeutics, um, and this requires us to, to change our clinical practice and to move forward with unique experiences that address and keep our patient at the center um, of our thoughts as we uh, go into clinical execution. Uh, and that's just a brief moment into DA01, and I look forward to telling you more about, it, about this and the data that we have seen in this clinical trial and the next time that I'm up on this podium. Um, MG01, this is a microglial cell or a myeloid cell derivation from our IPS cell platform, and the first foray we have that we'll look to move into at, as first application into lysosomal storage disease. Now, lysosomal storage disease is a genetic disorder. This is a field that we mostly leave up to the gene therapy applications in, in, in amongst our myths today. But I, I want you to think about um, uh, cell therapy as whole genome replacement. So instead of thinking about lysosomal storage disease, which is, a, in general, a collection of fairly rare diseases where there's a disorder of a mutation that leads to an inactive enzyme, and that can be through multiple different mutations and means, the collection of these become less than a rare event, and there is at least one in 5,000 uh, births across the world that allow us to think about our microglial cells going in across the applications of lysosomal storage disease to bring benefit. For these patients, it's a devastating uh, disease and, and diagnosis, as there is very few um, current therapies that benefit uh, the pediatric and the, and the young adult population. So how will a microglial cell work in such a setting? Well, as you'll know, a microglial cell is your brain's resident immune cell responsible for the maintenance and the upkeep of the system. Lysosomal storage disease, as you know, is a toxic buildup of the waste products of those cells. These cells have the ability and do secrete all of the enzymes that are required for that enzyme replacement therapy across the spectrum. And because of that, we're able to place these, uh, these allogeneic off-the-shelf cells into the brains of these uh, either infants or young adults and allow the enzymes to then cross-correct, head to the other cells for a recipient of that enzyme and then a, a deletion of the toxic buildup. Um, and, <clears throat> and with that, at application into, micro, into lysosomal storage disease, you can imagine that in entering the clinic, we can enter into one or several different of these disease patterns. Finally, as I mentioned, we think of the microglial cell as a platform cell technology, and we're eager to partner with others that have developed expertise in these different disease settings and have studied these diseases in this patient population for some time. So we'll enter into the clinic with, a, um, with the ability to enter a highly unmet medical need, desperate patient population in lysosomal storage disease, but very um, right on from that, as the hypothesis is to replace an enzyme, you can imagine that there are other than hypothesis leaps we can make into a more adult population, such as in frontal temp temporal dis uh, 
dementia, <laughs> as I forget, dementia in progranulin, um, as well as, and in the long term, make yet another hypothesis leap into uh, proteinopathies such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, and each one of these leaps allows us to use the very same manufacturing process, the very same cell type, and learn along uh, the journey as we go. So I seem to have used even more efficiently my time than the other speakers. And what I want to say to you is that at Blue Rock Therapeutics, it's really important that as we move forward, we're keeping the patient at the center of our focus. The medicines that we're making and that we're bringing forward look to bring benefit to degenerative uh, indications such as Parkinson's disease. I spoke to you earlier about uh, op our collaboration with Opsys Therapeutics. Um, and I didn't mention today, but I will in future meetings with you all talk about our cardiomyocytes that are looking to replace the cells lost uh, during uh, a heart attack. Those that millions of cells are simply dead and that, that muscle can no longer pump adequately um, and drugs are simply not enough to bring that back. And so, um, and finally, as, and I'll leave you with the thought of as we will be entering the clinic in both ophthalmology and in lysosomal storage disease, this is a company that has now multiple cell types entering into the clinic, all off of the very same um, induced pluripotent stem cell format. So with that, uh, if, if, if you uh, would enjoy, I'll take a question. If not, uh, thank you very much. All right. <laughs> So you mentioned uh, two things that I'll just say back to the audience. What about using a, a microglial cell, an allogeneic microglial cell in the brain of a recipient? So from uh, the lessons we're learning and also from the aforementioned fetal tissue studies that we've had, in our DAO1, we immunosuppress our patients for up to one year, and then we release the immunosuppression. Now, they've demonstrated in fetal cell uh, trials that even patients after uh, they have succumbed, and uh, we've had uh, autopsies done that those grafts are good for t up to 10 and 20 years after the graft has taken. And so in our DAO1 trial, we immunosuppress the patient and we place in an allogeneic cell. We envision a similar process will be uh, taken forward to begin with in our microglial cell. But as you mentioned, and as we've now uh, been moving forward in our pipeline, the first areas we're going into are immuno um, uh, immuno-privileged um, areas, such as the brain and the eye that you heard me talking about. But there are many, such as in cardiomyocytes, and even for patients where we don't want to immunosuppress them or it wouldn't be appropriate to do so, um, we have forward an immunovasive cell line that's, uh, that will be ready for use as well. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the day. <laughs>